Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Natural High. Are you stressed, feeling blue, or just looking for a pick-me-up? Well, try nature's homebrewed heroin or morphine. They're endorphins. But aren't those illegal, you ask? No, your body makes them. That's why they're endogenous opioids. So you don't have to worry about the DEA or local police knocking down your door while you're getting this high. Uh, but wait, what is the product if your body's naturally creating these things? Well, the product is running. No, seriously, go out and run. Push yourself hard, but not too hard. Endorphins are the painkillers produced in response to physical discomfort. Uh, but I'm not just talking about getting high on just one drug. Uh, I'm talking about getting high through running on two drugs. That's right, endocannabinoids, the body's natural THC analog, or marijuana, is produced in response to stress, uh, but that's opposed to pain, the stronger endorphin activator. Uh, so on a run, when you can't differentiate between physical stress and discomfort, uh, that means the same mechanism that triggers endorphins, running, can also trigger the production of endocannabinoids. So go out and run and get high, a natural high from running. I don't think I could write this introduction any better than Kay Alicia Fetters uh, in her article in Runner's World, How to Achieve a Runner's High. Uh, so I'm going to read the first couple paragraphs uh, from her article, How to Achieve a Runner's High, uh, to introduce the show for today. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't, but we always want it, and more of it. It's a runner's high, and when we're lucky enough to tap into it, our runs feel easy, exhilarating, even euphoric. But we aren't always that lucky, are we? Recently, researchers studied how the brain responds to running and found that the ability to get high while logging miles might be hardwired within us. Years ago, our ancestors' survival likely depended on chasing down food. The, de the desire to live was possibly their motivation to run and run fast, and the feel-good brain chemicals released when they did so may have helped them achieve the speed and distances required, says David A. Raiklin, Ph.D., an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona. The runner's high may have even served, and serves today, as a natural painkiller, masking tired legs and blistered feet, he says. Even though you no longer have to chase down your dinner, learning how a happy brain reacts, reactions are sparked may help you achieve the runner's high more often. Uh, and so now, pulling out from um, that uh, beginning of the article, How to Achieve a Runner's High, from K. Alicia Fetters, uh, how, what neurochemicals actually contribute to the runner's high is up for debate. So today I sit down with Katie Rose Sullivan to discuss the neural mechanisms thought to underlie the runner's high. So I'm here with a 2016 All-American in the DMR and school record holder, uh, also in the DMR, Katie Rose Sullivan. And we're talking about my favorite topics, uh, running and the brain. Uh, and I'd like to hear what got you interested in running. Interested in running? Yeah, and then we'll come back to the brain. Okay. I, um, I played soccer for most of like growing up, and I was the slowest one. <laughs> <laughs> slowest one on the field. And my dad was like, oh, like you want to do this in college? Like you got to try out for for track like gotta, gotta do it so I like bit the bullet went out for winter track sent us out for one run I was around the block run came around coaches like checked their stopwatch was like oh what happened and I was like oh I finished the run they're like no what happened like where'd you go and I was like no I did the route and they're like no way you did it in that time but I was like I get it yeah so then one thing led to the other now we're here running for half <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then jumping into running, uh, what is your interest in the brain? Yeah, so this um, report was on the, the endogenous opioid hypothesis and the endocannabinoid process or hypothesis for what is the neurological underpinnings of like the runner's high or the experience that you have after a particularly hard run or race that kind of gives you that like elated and, and euphoric feeling of like, wow, I just ran and it felt good. I'm going to run again. Which some people some people don't get, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think I feel in, or fall into that not getting category because uh, as I was reading your uh, infographic, I was like, hmm, none of that seems to make sense to me. <laughs> oh. uh. Yeah, so it's like characterized of like feelings of uh, 
reduce anxiety, um, increase like levels of sedation after run, um, kind of like decrease in like pain reception, and this kind of like general euphoric feeling, which creates like a real a real issue with with research because it's so subjective. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. How can you get mice to display euphoria? <laughs> right. Like, that's what they're struggling with. Yeah. Um, and so that it's created this contention between two competing hypotheses or two hypotheses and uh your exploration was kind of trying to see maybe one uh, was better than the other yeah so a lot of that is like pitting those two hypotheses against each other and i i would like to come out and say like oh like my research and like what i've read and like it clearly is this hypothesis but Mm -hmm. i just can't because it's like there's so many small nuances that it's more effective to look at this issue as coming from both sides and that one system will make up for the faults of the other possibly and that they just have to kind of meld together to complete this process. It just can't be simplified to one neurotransmitter, one hypothesis, Mm -hmm. this kind of reductionist process. Yeah, and and do you think uh, that there is a way? So you said that with mice, how do we know that a mice is experiencing euphoria? Yeah, uh, is there a way through like their wanting to run more that we can kind of infer that it was a pleasurable experience? Yeah, so they they do some research, um, particularly in mice, where they kind of have operational definitions for uh, reduced anxiety or um, elevated sedation, and then um, the last one. Um, anxiety sedation and uh like exhaustion or like pain i'm sorry pain reception yeah and they will make operational definitions for those and if they can get the mice to all display those they can almost kind of like grandfather in this euphoric feeling and that they would um continue to run after but it my research does outline like very interesting like ways that we have created like little tests on the mice to to show like oh they have reduced anxiety or increased sedation and mm-hmm. re- uh, reduced levels of pain um so yeah and how about in humans uh, is there kind of a an anecdotal tell of how we can induce we can do. so they they do have um those tests like analog tests to test how like much your difference your moods will change through days that you ha- don't exercise on or days after they like subjected these guys to like two mi- two hour runs and they're like okay. oh my god like, <laughs> you ran for two hours like some of these like if you look back on like what the requirements were to be in these e- examinations I was like there's no way this guy could run two hours yeah. but they they had these um, usually male college or like college to middle aged men do these runs and they um, would fill out forms and kind of a lot of self report um, one of the the hypotheses for the the um, the opioid hypothesis kind of rests on this idea that a lot of socially we have this idea like oh our endorphins keep us running Mm -hmm. but as you kind of look at more of the process of like what endorphins do and how they do it in the body like we can never definitively say that they affect the central nervous system because they can't cross the blood brain blood brain barrier Mm -hmm. so our research was always lacking in that kind of section where we can never figure out how to like measure the, this peripheral system of like oh when you exercise I see that your endorphins go up but I can't actually see inside the brain because they don't get in Okay. and then we can start looking at um, this new test that I think did um, like a heavy isotope of fluorine possibly mm-hmm. like F18 um, yeah. PET scans and that was able to kind of compete with different type of receptors for for these tests and show that when you have these like increased levels of uh, endorphins, you're gonna it's competing with the receptors for it, mm-hmm. which was one of the first tests that we could show that oh they're getting into the brain or though it has an effect on the central nervous system, and um, that's like what you can observe in a human, yeah. and then bring that back to the the analog tests and compare them mm-hmm. when you have those two like pieces of information together yeah and and do you think that this kind of like euphoric feeling uh, or this runner's high uh, has any explanation for this high incidence of former uh, drug addicts uh, in particular opioid act addicts yeah. in kind of like ultra marathoners i brought this up with uh, dylan as well um so you're saying 
do I think that whether or not we can access this opioid system through through running Mm -hmm. that that could have an effect on the performance based on like in some kind of addictive way yeah um yes I would say that there's similarities between because both of these theories the opioid and the endocannabinoid theory like kind of like you can trace it back to different types of drugs or exogenous versions of the chemicals different like chemicals that have some illicit like uses in our society and if we're hijacking those systems i i think that it's possible that you can get to like a point where you're saying oh this person is like moderately addicted or could show signs of addiction Mm -hmm. um one of the the people that like are really gung-ho about the endocannabinoid hypothesis will like often like cite like oh like in tests where we do on addicts where we're inducing something through the opioid hypothesis Mm -hmm. channel or system in the human body just mild stimulation of these receptors will produce like gastrointestinal issues and pinpoint pupils and like all this stuff that you don't exactly see once you like finish running or heavy marathoners or runners so there must be also a way for the body to kind of regulate that and that's like my own opinion that there has to be some type of like evolutionary mediator between the two is like oh running is a natural process because Mm -hmm. we have evolved to do so um and people think that our running capabilities our sweating capabilities are like one of the things that have gotten us here today in society so yeah um yeah the boom of uh barefoot running uh, yeah (laughs) was kind of the uh savannah long distance yeah. prey uh, yeah. theory uh, that we uh, basically ran animals to death mm-hmm. yeah so it and in a sense like it's interesting because there's there is an evolutionary adaptation for having this kind of like elated feeling at the end mm-hmm. of a run and that's to just to be like wow that was that was kind of nice like maybe i'll do it again tomorrow <laughs> yeah. So then that's how we, like, probably started to gather food, and that gave us strength to, like, carry on, like, day after day. Like, oh, this is an activity that benefits us in some way. Mm -hmm. So it was selected for, possibly, over evolutionary time. But, yeah. 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 Uh, And so kind of turning to your your infographic, uh, has there been any sort of public response that you've received from uh, family, friends, or fellow runners? Yeah, so, like, I... It got... I I don't know if it went on, like... um, Imgur or yeah. uh, like Reddit or something because someone sent me some like someone that I hadn't spoken to in a year sent some link it was like oh is this yours and I'm like yeah how did you find this <laughs> <laughs> and it actually I, I've forgotten my name on the assignment so it was like a pretty valid like oh like did you do this yeah. where is this from <laughs> so um, so yeah I guess like some some people if they looked really hard enough or stumbled across it they found out and it was kind of interesting to hear cool I, people. I tweeted it at the um, track and field coaches oh, uh, yeah. USTFFCA or whatever yeah. uh, so maybe someone uh, kind of found it through it. yeah because it was like I, th- I feel like uh, you sent it to like just before you went to nationals yeah we were and, at Boston oh yeah at Boston the, yeah. The hotel yeah and I um, like tweeted it out uh, then yeah. Uh, so at that group, like just before nationals yeah. was going to occur. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's see. So, uh, kind of moving forward, do you think that there's any newer developing areas of research that might help us? Uh, you kind of uh, brought up the F18 PET uh, for looking at this uh, question in humans. Is there any research that might help us answer this question? Yeah, we just, I think that there, first of all, and the endocannabinoid cannabinoid process needs to be just like further explored both systems aren't like truly understood but i think that one is like the lesser understood of the two so just further research on finding out those like finding the nuances between the the two um another interesting thing about the the endocannabinoid process is that it has two main receptors it's like c1 and c2 Mm -hmm. but a lot of research suggests that there's a third one that no one can find yet and they just like pencil it in as c3 and it's like, oh, there's a bunch of things we can't explain, so we're going to just create this other receptor that we haven't found yet. Right. So I guess, like, actually locating that receptor would be a good step forward. And still, like, looking at how we solve the issue between, like, endorphins getting 
their blood the blood level of endorphins raising in the peripheral nervous system but like not being able to affect the central nervous system mm-hmm. or maybe it can get across the blood brain barrier and we just don't know how or what or how it affects that process um so more clarity on that issue would be good too um so those people that are really gung-ho about the endocannabinoid system keep like like oh like pointing at that and yeah. saying like that's the fault in the opioid hypothesis mm-hmm. theory so yeah and do you think uh having this better understanding about your nervous system's response to running is changing you as a runner at all changing me as a uh, well, a lot of the working on this project I've done like before meet, so I guess it's been a good like pre meet amp up. So I was like getting the right mindset. Yeah, get reading the the biological underpinnings of what I'm about to do. It's like really amped me up for for Boston and then for nationals. But um, I think so. I like to I like to like break down that process and think about like what I'm actually doing and it's like gotta think about something on those 12 mile yeah, runs right. kinda, so <laughs> gotta keep you from going crazy somehow yeah I feel like most of the time when I reach the two hour barrier all I start thinking about is what I'm gonna eat when I get back <laughs> yeah uh, not so much like the euphoria of being out there being, running being yeah yeah I I think it's it is a euphoric process I think so I think this brings a new a new importance to it mm-hmm um, All right, so as we kind of wrap up here and uh, get you out to running, yeah. Uh, what uh, do you have anything that you'd like to promote or, or talk about? Um, yeah, I would like to promote just like the support for the women's uh, Hartford women's track and field team and our, our men's team as well. I think that the two programs are incredible and the coaches are incredible. I couldn't be happier running here, mm-hmm. um, and the science and the researchers that kind of figure out these issues for us so that we could sit at the end of our long run and think like oh yeah that's that's happening in my brain right now yeah I mean, like, yeah and we have a brand new beautiful track yeah and it will be great to hopefully in the next two years maybe mm-hmm. host a uh, conference sometime yeah we do have I, I believe we're penciled in for cross-country conferences next year okay so a little, little ways away but yeah, yeah and, and i don't think there's anything more fun than uh being at a track meet on a beautiful spring day alright so I think we'll both get out to our runs now so thank you so much for coming in so thanks so much to Katie Rose to Cup for coming in and talking about my two favorite topics, running and uh, the brain. Uh, as I've said in, I guess, now two of the shows on uh, running and the brain, uh, which one uh, I like more is kind of up for debate, I suppose. Uh, sometimes it's running, sometimes uh, the brain. Uh, but they're basically the only two things uh, that I'm uh, pursuing at any given time. Uh, and what an interesting topic to try to understand why uh, we run. Uh, is it because the uh, we have this evolutionary advantage for um, chasing down our food or uh, running away from predators uh, that we've uh, developed a neural mechanism to make us enjoy uh, running. Uh, I certainly enjoy running, uh, but uh, I'm, I hope it's more than just uh, feel-good brain chemicals uh, telling me to, to like running. Uh, and uh, seeing this debate is another great example of science uh, two uh, areas that seem to have lots of evidence on both sides. Uh, is it one or the other? Well, it's probably most likely both, uh, but it's fun to uh, see everyone try to talk about which one it is uh, as if it's not more than one possible mechanism. Uh, so wrapping up the show, uh, we'll have uh, two segments here. Uh, the first one, Jake's Jams, things that I've been interested in lately and things that I'd like to share with anyone listening. Uh, so since we were talking about running, uh, last time uh, when I spoke with Dylan, I talked about sock and shoes. Uh, this time, uh, after speaking with Katie Rose about uh, the runner's high, uh, I'm going to promote uh, the BMRC, Bryn Mawr Running Company. Uh, they have three locations around uh, kind of suburban uh, Philadelphia. The one closest to Haverford College here is uh, up in Bryn Mawr itself. Uh, and they have uh, great uh, shoes and great uh, clothing, uh, but also a number of amazing races uh, and events kind of throughout uh, the year. Um, every week they have Tuesday night sprint night uh, in which uh, individuals are invited to come join the uh, running company and 
uh, do a kind of speed workout together uh, end every Wednesday and Saturday, uh, Wednesday night uh, around 6.15. Uh, they meet up behind the store and go for some distance run somewhere between 5 and 9 or 11 miles. Uh, and then on Saturday mornings, I believe at 8 in the morning, they have, again, uh, longer distance runs somewhere between 7 and maybe 13 miles, uh, depending on how far you want to go. Uh, so the Bryn Mawr Running Company, uh, very nice, uh, very great uh, running company and uh, does a lot for the local running community. Uh, also, since uh, Katie Rose mentioned the Haverford women's track and field team, I'll also promote the Haverford tr- uh, track and field uh, team for both the men's and the women's. And as we said in the podcast, there's a brand new track out there uh, on Haverford's campus uh, that's uh, beautiful. And uh, and as I said, uh, there's nothing uh, more fun than a beautiful spring day watching uh, track and field. Uh, so, um, as she said, there's only one midweek um, event uh, or track meet uh, this year. Uh, hopefully, uh, they'll get a few more uh, track events uh, in the coming years. Uh, and so, then wrapping up the show with Twitter tweets, reader mail, uh, nothing so far, but you can reach me at EngageBrain on Twitter or at EngageBrainPodcast at gmail.com with any questions or suggestions. Uh, so, we'll wrap it up there. This has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks for listening.